Good to see you here this morning. We are going to be in 1 Thessalonians this morning. How about that countdown music? You awake yet from it? <laughs> I just felt like sleeping. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians, we're going to be in chapter 1. And this, uh, this 1 and 2 Thessalonians are, about, are focused on the end times. Um, we are in the end times. They felt like they were in the end times. These are the end times. And so Paul is writing for us to just be encouraged about where we're at because sometimes it's just easy for us to get discouraged and unsettled in the times that we live in, right? Um, things are interesting to say the least. We, uh, gender has become a fluid thing. It used to be there were men and women. Now it's, now it's something else. Um, our, our world situation is interesting. Um, and uh, Israel is fighting um, for their country. And, uh, and ideas are out there that uh, may not necessarily be new, but they're coming to the front and to the fore, and it's just a difficult time. And then we have social media, and we have all this stuff that we can see online, and we have our churches that are divided, and our churches that are talking you know, are the people at Bethel really believers? The people that lead Bethel, are they really believers? And the people that lead, um, uh, that lead Elevation Church, is, is Furtick really a believer? You can catch people that say he's not. And, um, and so who do we believe? Who do we know is speaking the truth? How do we know? And so this is... What Paul is here to confirm for these people and for us is to give us an encouragement and to have some things that we can point to that confirm that we are believers in Christ and we have believed the right message. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, it says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mention you in our prayers, and we continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith and your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, and in spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Acacia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report how kind, what kind of reception you gave us. And they tell how you turned from God to idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. So although sometimes it's easy to get discouraged and unsettled in the times we live in, just like these Thessalonians were discouraged and unsettled in the times that they lived in, we, Paul is letting us know here in this passage that Jesus has been raised from the dead and he is our deliverer. And that deliverer is specifically focused when he comes back on his second coming. And we should be grateful in the confirmation that we have as believers. And so Paul is writing to them, talking about how he is thankful for the confirmation that they have 
while they are believers. And so in verses 1 through 5, we should also be grateful that we display the evidence of salvation. And so Paul says, look, uh, we, we, thank, we thank God for you and we mention you in our prayers because of these things. And so these letters of encouragement and the, our letters, the first and second, second Thessalonians are letters of encouragement and their main purpose is to reassure the Thessalonians of the genuineness of their faith. And so we should be reassured today of the genuineness of our faith. They are, as a gathered people, in verse 1, as a gathered people of God, they are standing in the realm where God and Christ dominate, to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. They are standing in the realm where God and Christ dominate, and they are standing in His grace and peace right now, as we are standing in His grace and peace right now. And in the future, they will be standing in God's grace and peace by His promise. And that is true for us as well, is that we will stand in the grace and peace of God now and in the future. And this only comes then from turning from sin and turning to God. And I want you to take a look that this section focuses on the positive affirmation we have as believers in Christ. Paul is not examining them and is not telling them to examine themselves for sin or sinfulness. But instead, he's, he's coaching them to be grateful for the positive marks of the Christian life that they possess. And so his thankfulness and our thankfulness comes from these three, as from three aspects of prayer and the, one of those is the reflection of, go, of God's answers in the past. So the first aspect of prayer is that we are reflecting on how God has responded and answered our prayers in the past, and that should make us thankful and encourage us. And that as we reflect, our love for God is spurred on by His faithfulness and His provision. So as we pray, we should remember how God has responded and answered to us. And as we remember those things, our love for God is spurred on as we recognize how He has provided for us. And then in our confession of sin, we are assured of God's provision in Christ's shed blood and resurrection. And Peter says this well in 1 Peter 1, chapter, 3, or verse, chapter 1, verse 3 through 7. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice Thou, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief of all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So Paul is saying, we are thinking about you, Thessalonians. I am thinking about you, High Rock Church, and I see God's provision over these years. And I'm thinking about you, High Rock Church, and my love for God is spurred on for the way He has provided for us as a body. And I recognize the provision that He's given us through His shed blood and His resurrection, which affirms his faithfulness and the assuredness of his promise that will be completed when he comes again. And I want you to understand that Paul is not talking about individuals here. He's not saying, hey, look, some of you are doing this and some of you aren't. Some of you cause me to be thankful. Others, you've you know, caused me to be more prayerful. You know, he's not saying that. He's saying you, as a church body, 
I'm grateful. And so the church body is made up of individuals who are doing this, but as a church, they have they cause Paul to be thankful. And this gratefulness and the evidence of our salvation takes two tracks for Paul. The first is the evidence of genuine Christian living. And he says, um, he says in verse, uh, <clears throat> verse 3, we continually remember before our God and Father the work, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have faith, love, and hope. Faith, love, and hope. Paul is thankful for their faith, their love, and their hope. Their work produced by faith. And now this work here wants to be clear, this work is not good deeds. Okay? It's, it's not this do one nice thing for someone today. This work is focused specifically on an overt act to serve the Lord. An overt act to serve the Lord. That's what this work is focused on. This work is um, produced by faith. And so we're talking about evangelism. We're talking about purposefully coming and volunteering for the day of care. We're talking about being involved and volunteering a week of nights for VBS and then some. <laughs> right? It's, it's more than five, four, di five days. Um, we're talking about volunteering for the fall festival. We're talking about cleaning the bathrooms at the church as a direct, specific act to serve God. We're talking about teaching. We're talking about things like building these kneelers. We're talking about preparing and serving meals. We're talking about those that lead in worship. These are the acts that are done in overt service to God. And these are produced by faith. And your labor, he's thankful for their love, their labor produced, um, prompted by love. And this labor is the same sense of the work. Okay, it's an overt, an overt action to serve God. And his endurance inspired by hope. This is a faith that persists through trial and difficulty, and the hope of the promise of Jesus' return and our vindication in full redemption. So these three things, faith, love, and hope, are required to produce works that, vi that are visibly serve, uh, serve in God's interests and purposes. The faith in Christ brings you to a place where you serve. Love for God then motivates that service. And the hope in God's faithfulness and in Jesus' return results in a persistence to continue to do this service when the road becomes difficult. So the evidence of our salvation is in this genuine Christian living where we live by faith, love, and hope in our daily life. And the second is the evidence in the reception of the gospel. And there's another three here, power, Holy Spirit, conviction. The gospel produced a visible work, faith in Christ that resulted in works that were performed for God, love the God that motivates us to perform those works, and hope in God's faithfulness that gives us the persistence we need. And so this evidence 
of the gospel that Paul preached to them came with power and with conviction and with the Holy Spirit, and they could see it. So there's this family resemblance. This is what Paul is grateful for, this family resemblance. We look like the Father. We look like Jesus in our lives. We recognize this with children, right? The family resemblance, but it doesn't stop there. I mean, <clears throat> my dad's name is Dennis, and the older I get, the more I resemble Dennis. And many times I will do something and say something, and Cindy will say, okay, Dennis. <laughs> because the family resemblance is there. Now, we live in America where we focus on God's grace and love, but I want to tell you this, that we are deceived if we believe we have faith without family resemblance. And Paul is grateful that the Thessalonians have family resemblance. Now, in our current day and age, this tends to sound judgmental. But God has given us the spirit of discernment and he expects us to use it. And this is for us, okay? But I remember um, I was at a church in the Chicagoland area, and there was, there was a guy there. My children were young, um, like five and three or something like that, very young. They thought this guy looked like Jesus. He had a beard, long flowing dark hair. and He did. He looked like Jesus on TV, right? And, um, and so he was a faithful attender. Every single week he'd be there. And, um, and I would notice that he would come in, he would, and then he would drag somebody out, and they'd pray for him, and he'd be in prayer. And this was a regular habit for months on months. He'd come in, drag somebody out, They'd spend most of the time in prayer and talking during the service and then come back in. And I would always hear my elders get around him because he'd, he'd been to promise keepers and attended the men's meetings and all this kind of stuff. And they'd get around, look, you know, we, we want you to come and be more involved and come back to promise keepers and, you know, rekindle your relationship with God. And, and I got fed up. And they're in a group, and they're talking to them. And, if I, and I busted into the group, and I said, look, are you a believer? And he said to me the most telling thing. He said, do you mean am I a disciple? Boom. He knew exactly what he was doing. I said, yes. He said, no. It turned out he was a self-practicing Satanist. And I took my elder board and I said, no one is to go out of the service with him. I don't care what he asks for. I don't care who he wants to pray for him. He, you ask him, you tell him, nope, we're not leaving service. You be here all you want, but you're not leaving service. You're being disruptive. <laughs> he did not have the family resemblance. did not have the family resemblance. So our application for us is to examine ourselves. Don't look at your sin. Don't look at your failings. But we'll look at your work and your labor for the kingdom. Take encouragement in God for what you have done for the kingdom. It is evidence of your salvation, be grateful for it and continue to grow in it and in that work, continue to grow in that work and labor. Don't look at your failings. Don't look, oh, I don't do enough. They don't do. Look at the work that you do do. 
and you have done. Take encouragement by it. And grow in it. If you need to do more, do more. Little steps. If you need to change what you're doing, then do something else. Do it. But be encouraged by it. It's a sign that you are a believer. So we should be grateful when we display the evidence of salvation. And we should be grateful when we display the marks of a true messenger. It's verses uh, 6 through 10. So there's gratefulness for Paul that these people display the marks of a true me messenger. This also takes two ta tracks for Paul. And they are observable tracks. They are observable marks. And the first of it is here in 6, verse 6, you became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. A true messenger is an imitator. They're imitators of Christ-like people, and they're imitators of Christ. They're imitators of Christ-like people, and they're imitators of Christ. We need to recognize that it is the reflection of Christ in us that induces others to be Christ-like. It is the reflection in Christ, of Christ in us that helps others to become Christ-like, whether they're believers or not. And this imitation here is in a specific context here in this passage. And that context is the joy of the gospel in the midst of suffering. The joy of the gospel in the midst of suffering. In Acts 16... Beginning in verse 22, we have Paul's example. Paul was grateful that they were imitating him. The crowd joined the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. In Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, imitating Christ. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scoring in its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you not, will not grow weary and lose heart. And so the Imitation is the imitation of those who are joyful in the midst of suffering. This is what we are to imitate, joy in the midst of suffering. A true messenger is also a model. This is a pattern that can be influenced or a mold like you pour liquid into a mold, and it becomes what the mold is. And the focus here is on Christ-like reaction to difficulty in trial. When we react to difficulty in trial and attack in a Christ-like manner, it rings out the gospel as nothing else. It says, the Lord's message in verse 8 rang out from you. It rang out. This word translated rang out is never used anywhere else in the New Testament. It is used in secular literature, and it has the quality of a loud noise, and it's used to describe things like a pack of howling dogs or a blowing trumpets. 
This is a loud noise. The Christ-like response to suffering rings out the message of God like a sounding trumpet or an annoying pack of howling dogs. I used to live on a cattle ranch in Oklahoma when I was a pastor there, and you could hear the coyotes at night just howling away. It's this ringing that you don't forget, this noise. And our Christ-like response to suffering, to trial, to attack, to difficulty rings out this message. This is an evangelistic force to be reckoned with. It is so forceful and so obvious that there is no need to explain or reinforce the message. Paul says, therefore, we did not need to say anything about it. They received this message with joy in spite of suffering, and it rang out the gospel message in such a way that Paul didn't need to say anything more. It is the ultimate proof that a person has turned from sin, turned to serve God, and they're waiting for Christ's return. This is counterintuitive, isn't it? We think if we're going to stand for Christ, we need to stand up. We need to stand up for what's right, and we need to make it known what's right. And we need to speak up when we see a wrong, and we need to teach, and we need to instruct but Paul is saying, no, Christ-like response to difficulty in trial with joy and gratefulness is in the evidence of our salvation and is the mark that we are true messengers of the gospel of Christ. We were in a at a church um, in, in the Illinois area, and um, we, um, we had developed a form of what you see here um, with our Ten Embrace service and our Christmas Eve service. And this was a small church. Uh, there was a traditional service of about 15 or 20. We had about 50 or 60 in the contemporary service. Small church, um, but on Good Friday and on Christmas Eve, um, we had two to three hundred people each time. God was just doing the work, and um, there was a, a man in the front row who was uh, a spouse to one of the members. Cindy had never seen him before, and you know how Cindy is, right? It's Christmas Eve. She goes up. She shakes her hand. shakes his hand. She says, oh, I, I haven't seen you. Are you new here? I don't know who you are. And he says to her, he says, I know who you are. Your husband is destroying this church. And she just ended it. I mean, if you know Cindy, she'd want to defend me. She just ended it and walked away. It's Christ-like approach to attack and trouble. She rang out the gospel with this man. This is... Um, this is hard. Men, we tend to respond in anger when things don't, don't go well, don't we? I tell you what, you can pray with your kids, you can do Bible study with your kids. When we learn to respond with joy and peace and gratefulness when things go wrong, that will minister the message of the gospel to our children. I know I am naturally a man of anger, and it's violent anger.
Women, when you're hurt, things go wrong. It's usually the, usually the course of action. Not always, but usually the course of action. Gather your friends and talk about it, right? If we can respond to these things without gossip, without rehashing, in grace and gratefulness for who God is and what He's done for us, that rings out the gospel message to everyone around. And so Paul is saying, hey, examine yourself. Don't look at your sin. Don't look at your failings. Look at how you've responded in situations. Look at how you've grown. There's a, a preacher. Um, he, he's, uh, he's kind of the unknown founding person of the, um, of the uh, charismatic, uh, charismatic Episcopal Church here in the United States. He doesn't really associate with it, but everybody points to his teachings as the source of this movement. And he tells a story of a man who came down and he was just crying and bawling at the altar. And so he goes and he prays for him. He says, what is causing your distress? He said, well, I was at a bar last night and I beat up two guys and, and it just wasn't good. And he said, be encouraged. Last month before you got saved, you wouldn't have been sorry about it. Take your steps. Take your encouragement. We all have room to grow. So examine where God has brought you in to be a true messenger, in to be a true imitator, and be grateful for that and then grow with it and let it expand and become more complete. Let your transformation become more full. Let it become more than just disciplined action and turn into something that flows from who you're becoming because you've received this gospel message with joy. You're not going to let the difficulties of life deter you from continuing to serve God. So they received this message, and the result was, the conclusion was they have turned from their sin, and they serve God, and they're waiting for Him to come again. So I want you just to think, about your life right now and take encouragement take encouragement for where God has brought you from if you don't have a relationship with Christ right now then take encouragement you can begin it now and your life can start to change now. It won't be easy. It'll require work. It'll require change on your part. But the gospel message is a message of joy and of peace and of hope. And so as we sing this last song together, song called Gracefully Broken. It, I mean, it, it describes, I think, the posture we should have. I am broken, but I'm under the grace of God. Take my hands that I might serve you, overtly serve you, not just be a nicer person, but spend my life on the kingdom of God. And this is encouragement. This is designed to encourage us 
to grow and to enjoy this life that we have, even though there's difficulty and there's uncertainty. And this is proof to yourself that you have believed the message and it's making a difference. So let's stand together. God, we just ask for you to speak further to us. Help us to look at our lives honestly and get encouragement from what you have done. And find hope in that you are faithful and you will continue to work in us. Confirm in us the fact that we are believers. And confirm in us the fact that we are true messengers of your kingdom.